good finish. Um, anyway, um, I have a prediction. In fact, I am determined to make this, this sounds a bit better than yesterday, right? Learning, always learning. Anyway, um, yes, this is going to be the last episode of the Jay and Sutra's recitals, even if it runs a little long. That's what I call determination. Oh, thank you, Oliver. That means a lot to me. Okay, enough silliness. Let's jump right in, because the less I ramble on, the more we'll be able to... Anyway, <clears throat> stay focused today. A little more than yesterday. How is everybody? You doing all right? Did you have a good May Day? How did you celebrate? Well, I know how you celebrated. That was fun. All right. Okay, uh, next section is called Puri Sutamana, Supreme Amongst Men. The Tirtankaras are described as Puri Sutamanam, or superior amongst men. Both their internal and external qualities are divine and extraordinary. Another pickup line. The form of the Lord is dazzling to all the three worlds. His body is special, possessing 1,008 qualities indicating his significance. The internal qualities refer to the infinite knowledge, infinite vision, and so on. None can ever compare with these great Tirtankaras, not even the celestials that rule the heavens. Purisa Sihanam, lions amongst men. The Tirtankaras are considered lions amongst men. The lion is considered as an ignorant and ferocious animal, then how can the Tirtankaras, who are an eternal fountain of kindness and compassion, be compared to it? But here is, but here the implication is that of the bravery and courage of the lion. Just as the lion is fearless by his strength and command, the Tirtankaras are fearless in this world. No other person can compare to them in strength and austerity of the self. Puri Savara Pundariyanam, lotuses amongst men. The Tirtankaras are also compared to the great white lotus, namely Punarika. The white lotus is superior to other lotuses in beauty and fragrance. A white lotus in a pond can spread more fragrance compared to thousands of other lotuses. The bees are attracted to it from a distance. It spreads its fragrance in the world without any selfish motive. This is the reason why the Tirtankaras are compared to this lotus. The fragrance of their spiritual existence is eternal. They spread the fragrance of their qualities, such as nonviolence and truth. The fragrance of the lotus, lotus lasts until it withers, but the lives of Tirtankaras will touch the lives of the multitude forever. Just as the lotus is white, the life of a Tirtankara is also white and untarnished by even a tinge of attachment and aversion. And finally, just as the lotus is unaffected by the sludge of the pond, the Tirtankaras are unaffected by the activities or vasanas of the world around them. Puri Savara Gandha Hatha Hainam, Gandhahasti amongst men. Merry Christmas, by the way. It's May 2nd, so, you know, it's Christmas somewhere, right? Okay. 
The Tirtankaras are considered as the elephant Gandha Hasti. The lion is a symbol of bravery and not of fragrance. Yeah, who wants to smell a lion, right? And the lotus, that of fragrance, but not of bravery. Right. But the Gandha Hasti is a fragrant elephant and is symbolic of both qualities. Hmm. Fragrant elephant. That's interesting. This legendary elephant, ah, no wonder, is believed to be magnificent with a powerful fragrance that makes other elephants panic and bolt from a battlefield. Anyway, the Ganda Hasti, it's not popular to have elephants on the battlefield anymore, but, you know, unless you're Lord of the Rings. Um, the Ganda Hasti is considered auspicious in Indian literature. It is said that neither famine nor flood can afflict a region inhabited by the Gandha Hasti. There is always abundance of everything in its grand presence. Thus, the Tirtankaras are also considered as the Gandha Hasti of humanity. Their power and aura are so strong that all negative emotions and actions, such as violence, torture, ignorance, and pretense, however powerful they may be, cannot sustain. Even if these negativities have ruled for centuries, they vanish as soon as the voice of the Tirtankaras is heard. Furthermore, just like the Gandha Hasti, wherever the Tirtankaras tread the soil, all calamities come to an end. Peace reigns in the vicinity of the Tirtankaras. It is to be noted that it is to be noted that not just internal blemishes of passions come to an end with the blessings of the Tirtankaras, but external problems also see their end. Loga Paivanam beacons of the universe. Pharos Illuminatus. No. Uh, the Tirtankaras are said to be the lamp of the universe. When the darkness of ignorance becomes very thick, and one cannot even sense a glimmer of truth and welfare, the Tirtankaras spread the light of their knowledge in this world and illuminate the path of truth. A lamp in a house illuminates just a corner, but the Tirtankaras are the lamp of the three worlds. The responsibility of illuminating this universe rests with them. The lamp in the house needs a wick and oil and burns for a short time. But the Tirtankaras illuminate beyond the limits of time and space. It says space and time. I switched it for some reason. Then why have the Tirtankaras been compared to a lamp? Rather than the sun and the moon. If you reflect, you will find that the sun and the moon have the power to shed light, but they cannot transform anyone to have their qualities. But just as thousands of lamps can be lit by touching their wicks to a burning lamp, the Tirtankaras shine and spread their light and enlighten the life of ass prince. Abhayadhayanam, bestowers of fearlessness. Among all boons, B-O-O-N-S, you can Google that if you need to, it is the boon of fearlessness that is considered supreme. Compassion of the heart is fully understood only with the blessing of fearlessness. If you're watching this from India, I, I know boon is a Everybody knows that word. I'm talking to the people outside of India. They've probably never heard it unless they've read old books. Anyway, Danata, excuse me, Danana Setham Abhayapayanam from Sutra Kartanga 6 slash 23. Verily, the Tirtankaras are kind and compassionate in all the three worlds. 
their heart is filled with the ocean of compassion, which they extend even towards those who have hurt them. They know not what they do. Remember the example of the arrogant Gosalaka, whom the Lord saved from the wrath of the yogi. Oh, those yogis and their wrath. Um, the story of how Lord Mahavir forgave the serpent Kanda Kausika, exclamation point. The Tirtankaras are born at times when humanity has forgotten its path when injustice and violence unleash their deadly power. The Tirtankaras calm the world with their teachings and guidance toward the right path, irrespective of gender, caste, creed, and status. They have set themselves the task of gently redirecting the stream of humanity onto the right path. Kakudayanam, bestowers of vision. However healthy a person may be, if he has no vision, his life could be very burdensome indeed. If a blind man gain, if a blind man gains vision, can you imagine his joy? I can see. I, I, I am not blind anymore. Oh, I know. Stay away. What it means to see. Yeah, basically just like that. Uh, the Tirtankaras are known as givers of vision. When the web of ignorance spreads before the eyes and one loses sight of the distinction between truth and non vision, it is the Tirtankaras who clear those webs and give the vision of wisdom. There is an old tale about a miraculous temple. Any blind devotee who prayed there would be blessed with sight. The blind would go there with the help of a walking stick, and as soon as they gain vision, they joyously throw the stick away and walk free. The Tirtankaras are also such miraculous deities, since those who are blinded by passion gain the sight of wisdom in their presence. The serpent Kanda Kausika's life depicts exactly this. He was blinded by anger and ignorance, which dissipated in Lord Mahavir's presence. Kakavatinam, conqueror. When the land is divided over petty issues, and has lost its unity. It is the Kakravirti, or crowned head of the land, who brings back peace, unity, and order. Until Guinevere runs off. This is the aim and role of a good king. So also, the Tirtankaras are the Kakravirtis, or sovereigns of religion as they spread its true message in all the directions with the aim of reinstating the right path for a wayward humanity. They establish the fourfold path of charity, austerity, celibacy, and contemplation. And then after one generation, there's nobody left. Just kidding. Not everybody's celibate. Okay. And by performing penances till the very end of their lives, they teach the masses to do the same. It is the religious wheel of the Tirtankaras that can establish material and spiritual peace in this world. They have the power to end debates and conflicts between religions and embellish and establish uh, an undivided world. Though the Kakravertis are guided just by their own power, the Tirtankaras are embodiment of peace and spiritual strength. They become the masters, not of our bodies, but of our souls. Via Tachaumanam, devoid of deceit. The Tirtankaras are known as those who are free of pretense, 
Chadma, or pretense, has two meanings, covering up and cheating. Thank you. The four gati karmas, which obstruct the true nature of the soul, are known as chadma. Chadayatiti, chadma, yanavaraniyadi, from Pratikramana Sutra Pada Vivirti Pranipatanandaka. Those who are free of these Chadma karmas are the Tirtankaras. They are free of ignorance and attachment. Their life is simple and equanimous. Equa, equanimous. 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 They have no hidden agendas. They share all that they have with the world at large. Their words have the power to give validity to scriptures. Their discourses are proven, conceptually strong, beneficial, and defy the wrong path. Aptopanyamanulan Dhyamamadurstestavirodakam Tatvopadesakert Sarvam, comma, Sastram Sapata hyphen Gatanam from Nyayavatara nine. It's the number number nine. Right. The voice of the Tirtankaras, universal welfare. Right? That's what I'm talking about. Okay, the life of the Tirtankaras, I mean, yeah, is not just for their own salvation, but also for the redemption of others. Oh, they're early Mahayanas, right? Just kidding. Totally kidding. Too many levels. They cross their own karmas and help others overcome them as well. Those who sing the praises of salvation for oneself must look at this great ideal. The question is, why do the Tirtankaras wander far and wide to give the message of truth and nonviolence? They have found their own salvation. So what is left for them to do? What do they gain by watching over others? How does the spiritual awakening of others benefit them, and why? Would their special status as evolved souls be lost if they did not give discourses to others? The answer to all of these questions is that the Tirtankaras do not gain anything by imparting their wisdom. Their actions are neither for their own benefit, nor are they interested in gathering groups or heading cults. They are beyond attachment and aversion. Their discourses resound with the thought of universal welfare and nothing else. They are fountains of compassion. This feeling of compassion is the base of their exalted life. The greatness of Jainism is not just in seeing one's own welfare, but that of the others as well. Even after attaining Kavala Jnana, Lord Mahavir wandered for 30 years, spreading the message of love and nonviolence. Dharma Muktavan Praninamanugrahartam, Kama Na Puja Satkarartam, from Sutra Kirtanga Tika 1 slash 6 slash 4. The same thought of the above commentary is also found in the primary agamas. Savajagavjiva rakana deataye pavayanam bhagavaya sukahiyam. That came from Prasnavyakarana Sutra 2 slash 1. Next section. <clears throat> Savadarisinam, omniscient beings. 
When you look at the Namo Tunam Sutra, you will see that the condition for achieving omniscience is the complete removal of attachment and aversion. Without conquering attachment and aversion, one cannot find the elevated status which brings omniscience. Without becoming omniscient, one does not become worthy of being worshipped by the masses. Akarya Hemachandra states, Sarvangyo Jitaragadi Sosastrailokya Pujita Yatastitarta Vadi Cha Devo Erhan Paramesvara from Yoga Sastra 2 slash 4. The posture for reciting Namo Tunam. There are many views about the correct posture to be adopted while reciting the Namo Tunam. Akarya Nami, the great commentator of Pratikramana Sutra, prescribes the Pang. Changa posture. This is done by bending and touching the ground with the knees, hands, and forehead, then paying obeisance. But Akarya Hemachandra and Hari Bhadra prescribe the Yoga Mudra, which has been adopted in the earlier chapter of Alokandra Sutra. Via gamas such as Raja Prasniya and Kalpusutra, where the devas pay obeisance to the Tirtankaras, there is a tradition of positioning the right knee on the floor, the left knee at a right angle to the floor, and both palms coming together at the forehead of humility and reverence. Nowadays, the Stanakavasis read the Namotunam twice. The first reading is to pay obeisance to the Siddhas, and the second to the Arhantas. There is not much difference except that in the Namotunam to the Arhantas, Tanam Sampavyu Kamanam is stated instead of Tanam Sampatanam. The meaning of Tanam Sampavyu Kamanam is those Arihantas who are yet to undergo their karmas through their body will attain moksha once they have completed their karmas. That's a lot of meaning to pack into such a tiny little word. It happens a lot. I mean, when there's a language that's like developed in a particular, you know, um, mentality, in a particular way of thinking, and then you translate it into a language that's very much not, then it takes like sometimes like 10 or 20 words to define one word. Uh, my favorite example of that is how leolam in Hebrew becomes uh, paromnia secula seculorum in Latin, or uh, forever and ever and unto the ages of ages in English. Leolam. Anyway. Uh-oh, did I lose my place? Um, yes, I did, but I found it. It is to be noted that they do not aspire for moksha because they are beyond aspirations. Moksha is their goal, not a mere aspiration. Right. It must be noted that reciting not let's pause for a second. Not a not an aspiration, a goal. Hmm. Alright, anyway. It must be noted that reciting Namo to Nam twice is not found in the ancient texts and agamas. When we look at this sutra in a subtle manner, we realize that this is neither for the Siddhas nor for all the Arihantas. Arihantas are of two kinds, Samanya Kevalis and Tirtankaras. Ta Samanya Kevalis are those who have attained omniscience, but they are not establishers of the ford, like the Tirtankaras. Many of the adjectives, such as Ford founders, Titayaranam, self-realized, Sayam Sambudhanam, and charioteers of religion, Dhamma Sarahinam, cannot be applied to the Semanya Kevalis. They refer, they refer only to the Tirtankaras. 
And hence this sutra is to pay obeisance to the Tirtankaras. Namo to Nam, <clears throat> an obeisance to the Tirtan, an obeisance to Tirtankaras. In my humble opinion, so in the humble opinion of Upadhyaya Amar Muni, 20th century Jainist saint, in his humble opinion, we must recite the first Namo to Nam of Tanam Sampa Tanam and not the second of Tanam Sampa Vyu Kamanam. The latter is only for the Tirtankaras who are present in the Bharata Kasera, the world where we reside. However, there are no Tirtankaras present in the Bharata Kasetra. You may refute me by saying that there are 20 Viharmanas, also known as Viharmana Tirtankaras, present forever in the Mahavideha Kasetra. Uh, vi Viharmanas are also Tirtankaras, but they have not yet obtained moksha. We are not in their reign now, as they are not Ford makers. Our Ford founders are the 24 Tirtankaras from Ursabhedava to Mahavira. My contention is that Tirtankaras must be revered during the period of their reign not otherwise. So, if you are not in the period of their reign, and you are not following the rules prescribed by them, then there is no basis upon which to worship them. Hence, the Viharmanas do not qualify for worship in this sutra. This is seen in the ancient Agamic literature, where the second Namo Tunam is not read if the Tirtankaras are absent. In the Draupadi Adhyayana of the Yata Sutra, Dharma Ruchi Anagara read the first Namo Tunam during Santara, embracing voluntary death, and not the second. In this same sutra, the brothers of Kundarika, namely Pundarika and Arhanaka, also read the first Namo to Nam during Santara. You may ask, what if there was an absence of Tirtankaras in this world at that time? The Tirtankaras were present in the Mahavideha Kasetra even then. By this understanding, it is clear that according to the Agamas, the first Namo Tunam must be read for those who have attained the Tirtankara status and must become Siddhas. If Tirtankaras are present now, according to the description of their births in various scriptures, one must take the name and add it to the second Namo Tunam and utter their names accordingly. I have stated my thoughts here, not out of insistence, but in the hope that scholars who read this may want to reflect upon it. Well, thank you. I shall a bit. The Nine Sampadas. As we have already mentioned, Sampada means relaxation. In this Namo Tunam Sutra, nine kinds of Sampadas have been mentioned. The first one is Stotavya Sampada, which has instructions for the supreme being worthy of worship, an obvious reference to the Tirtankaras. I'm feeling relaxed, aren't you? Um, the first one, we just read that. The second one is Samanya Hetu Sampada. This gives a description of the common qualities that make someone worthy of being worshipped. Jainism is a scientific and logical religion. It does not worship anybody without reason. That's the very definition of scientific and logical right there. But rather prescribes that worship should be based on the qualities of the deity. Yes, it's science. Sorry, I'm just playing. It's an interesting combination, like uh, coming from the 
a culture that's kind of like mostly atheist and then Christian, because Christians are all about, do not, you better not worship anybody. Oh my God, you'll get struck by lightning unless you worship only the most high God and formless one, who, by the way, took the form only once and was exactly like these guys, except that he was God. And uh, then the other half of the people are completely scientific and logical, but absolutely atheistic. And the word worship doesn't enter their vocabulary unless they're like mocking those religious people. So it's that's why my facial expressions, and I'm sorry if it's coming across as disrespectful. Anyway, the third uh, is visesa hetu sampada, which enumerates the special qualities that make someone worthy of worship. The fourth <clears throat> is upayoga sampada, which describes the benevolence of the tirthankaras and the benefits of welfare that have been imparted. The fifth is hetu sampada, connected with upayoga. It tells us how the Tirtankaras have done great welfare work for humanity. <coughs> Excuse me. The sixth is Visesa Upayoga Sampada, which describes the special and extraordinary efforts of the Tirtankaras for universal well being. The seventh is Sahetu Svarupa Sampada. Here, the true and pristine form of the Tirtankaras is outlined by their qualities such as knowledge and vision. The eighth is Nijasama Palada, Palada Sampada. In this, by the phrases Javayanam, Bohayanam, and Moyaganam, it is indicated that the Tirtankaras have potential to elevate souls to their own Sita status by their spiritual teachings. The ninth is Moksha Sampada. Here, using intense adjectives such as Shiva, or Siva maybe, a uh, pure soul, alive, eternal, indestructible, immovable, etc., a simple and profound description of the form of Moksha has been outlined. To those who respond to this by saying that any place, including the seat of liberation, is an inert object to which adjectives such as soul, which is not inert, cannot be applied, the respond is that moksha or emancipation is not merely an inert place, but a unity of place and souls. I think they mean response. It's okay. It is the final destination or highest status that a soul can attain. Many names. This sutra has many popular names. It is called Namotunam since it has been created by the first alphabets according to the Anu Yoga Dvara Sutra. It is also called Sakrastava. Uh, the, in the Jambu Dvipa Pranyapati Sutra and Kalpu Sutra, there is a description that the Lord of the First Heaven, namely Sakra Indra, worshipped the Tirtankaras with this sutra. Another name for this sutra is Pranipata Dandaka. It has been mentioned in the Svopanyavirti. Pratikramana Virti and other texts of the Yoga Sastra. Pranipata means obeisance, hence this name is befitting too. All these three names have a scriptural base with equally deep significance and meaning. Thus, there need never be a preference of one over the other. Significance. There is so much importance given to this Namotunam Sutra in the Jaina religion because of its devotional power. It is indeed a great tribute to pay to the Tirtankaras. The Uttaradhyaya Sutra describes the benefits one can receive by worshipping these great souls. <coughs> Tava tui mangalenam nana dansana karita bohilabam janayai 
nana darsana karita bohi la ba sampane yanam jive anta kiriyam kapa vimanova vatiyam arahanam arahe. This means that by worshipping the Tirtankaras, one gets an awakening, or bodhi, of knowledge, vision, and conduct. Using this bodhi with minimal efforts, an aspirant can reach a heaven called Kalpa Vimana. With greater efforts, he can attain enlightenment too. Therefore, the essence of this sutra is that one worships the Tirtankaras, one who worships the Tirtankaras becomes worthy of spiritual practices. Thus, let us use this treasure of devotion to free ourselves from the shackles of spiritual bankruptcy, which has chained us since time immemorial, and attain clear vision and sublime peace for the self. All right. Let's take a moment, absorb all that. Okay. Let us move on now to the Samti Sutra, Samapti Sutra, the Sutra of Conclusion. Take it away, somebody. Yes, sir. Navamasa Sama Iya Vayasa Panchayara Jani Yava Na Samairi Yava Tanjaha Mana Dupani Hani Vaya Dupani Hani Kaya Dupani Hani Sama Yasa Say Akarna Yai Sama Yasa Anavati Yasa Karnai Tasa Vichami Dukkadam Samayam Samam Kayanam, na fasiyam, na paliyam, na tiriyam, na kittiyam, na sohiyam, na arahiyam, anai, anu paliyam, na bhavai, tas michami dukkadam. Okay, so that's what that sounds like. Um, here is the meaning in uh, more flowy English. During this ninth vow of Samayika, one must be aware of the five transgressions to be avoided. They are, one, to allow the mind to wander on the wrong path. Two, to allow the speech to traverse the wrong path. Three, to allow the body to walk the wrong path. Four, to conclude Samayika midway, even in a moment of thoughtlessness. Five, to perform samayika with disturbance. If I am guilty of any of the above transgressions, may my sins become void by alokana, introspection. Cleanse the inner being by earnest prayer, saying, quote, If I have not performed the vow of samayika perfectly, not followed its rules, not completed it with purity of heart, not recited its texts correctly, nor worshipped in the right manner in accordance with the rules laid down by the gods, then may any sins of mine related to these transgressions become void. No end quote. Everything else in this book and throughout all eternity is contained within those quotes. No, I'm just going to like quote, end quote, guys. Guys, I'm just playing. Analysis. An aspirant is surrounded by the atmosphere of ignorance and delusion. Therefore, despite being vigilant, he is often prone to errors. I know I am. Quite a few. When one commits mistakes, even in obvious manners of the household... How can he escape errors in subtle religious activities? He could claim they're not errors and that nobody can prove him wrong and that he's just the founder of his own religion of one. And heh, heh, so who's going to prove me wrong? 
I am the new Tartankara, and uh, so I've come to rewrite without making any reference to the previous... There's a number of ways, but I'll, I'll just keep reading. <clears throat> Here, even the slightest indulgence in attachment and aversion, a slight remembrance of sensory objects and passions, causes disturbance in religious activities and blemishes the soul. It needs to be set right immediately to avoid long-lasting negativity of the aspirant's sadhana. Four kinds of wrongdoings. <clears throat> the samayika is a very important religious activity and needs to be followed correctly in life. But the passions that have attached themselves to the soul over time do not allow the aspirant to progress easily. Even a duration as small as an antar muhurta does not pass peacefully. Presumably that's a very short amount of time. Uh, therefore, it is the duty of the aspirant to be very watchful of himself during samayika, to make null and void by introspection and atonement any wrongs he may commit during samayika. Any vow can be violated by four means by atikrama, vyatikrama, aren't you glad I'm not saying krama, um, atikara, anaka, and anakara. Atikrama means destruction of the gentleness of the mind accompanied by a resolve to perform an inappropriate act. All right. Thus, it is a mental act of transgression. When one starts preparing and becomes ready to commit the inappropriate act, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, <laughs> and thus is ready to transgress the vow, it is the stage of vyati krama, krama, to move ahead and collect the things needed to transgress the vow, is atikara, and finally to transgress the vow itself is Anakara. You told me you were combing your hair! I was! I was! Okay. The difference between Atikara and, Ati, and, and Anakara. In the stage of Atikara, the transgression of the vow is incomplete. But in Anakara, it is complete transgression. The sins of Atikara can only cause a blemish in the vow. They do not destroy the vow. Therefore, these blemishes can be removed by introspection and atonement. But with Anakara, or Chara perhaps, the transgression of the vow is complete. Under such circumstances, the vow has to be adopted afresh. Next Sunday at confession. No. It is the duty of the aspirant to protect himself from the wrongs of Atikrama. He must be vigilant and clear all flaws by introspection, never allowing himself to move toward Anachara. As one becomes more vigilant in life, restraint becomes stronger. It is to purify the wrongs committed during Samayika that the Samapti Sutra has been in existence. In this sutra, it is the transgressions of Samayika that have been written about and criticized. Among those transgressions that can taint Samayika, the Antikaras are the primary ones. Hence, when Atikaras, the Atikaras are the primary ones, Hence, when the Atikaras are corrected by introspection, Atikrama and Vyatikrama are understandably set right. <clears throat> the five Atikaras. These are five Atikaras in, Sami, in Samayika, which are as follows. One, when the mind is focused on worldly matters and resolves that are not related to Samayika, such transgressions of mind are known as mana dupani hane. Two, uttering thoughtless, careless, bitter, harsh, and vulgar words, or speaking unnecessarily during samayika 
are transgressions of speech known as via dupanihane. Three, to be physically restless during samayika and moving about without reason or vigilance are transgressions of body known as kaya dupanihane. Four, to forget that one is in a state of samayika or the number of samayikas one has vowed to undertake or to forget the procedure of commencing samayika are transgressions of memory known as samayasa sai akaranaya. Better remember that. Just kidding. This also includes irregularity in performing samayika. Oh, okay. Five, to be bored during samayika, to wait impatiently for the duration of samayika to end, or to conclude samayika before its specified duration, are known as anavatiyasa dosa of samayika. <clears throat> if samayika is completed deliberately before its specified duration, it is anachara. But if one concludes it by mistaking its duration to be over, it is not anachara but atikara. Conclusion. The obvious question is that since mental activities are so subtle, that as much as one may try, one cannot escape certain transgressions of samayika. Is it not better to avoid samayika altogether rather than to commit the transgressions? Or you could just become Buddhist. No, sorry. The answer to this is that there are six stages for the vow of samayika, even if the first mental transgression cannot be overcome. There are still five stages that remain. And so Samayika remains and does not disappear from life altogether. To avoid action for fear of mistakes is foolishness. Wisdom. The term Machami Dukanam is there for precisely this reason, that one can repent and atone for one's sins. Samayika is a, is a Siksa Vrata, which means a Siksa Vrata which means it can be attained by constant practice. It is indubitable that the practice of Samayika will bear rich fruit. Cool. Appendix. Procedure of Samayika. The procedure to commence Samayika. Choose a calm and quiet place. Clean it. Place a pure white and clean asana or sitting mat. Commence samayika in the appropriate attire for prayer. Clothing such as turbans and coats must be removed. The muhapati or the piece of cloth to cover the mouth is a must. Like that. Okay. Either seated or in the Padmasana, or standing in Jina Mudra, one must begin by prostrating in the eastern or nor northern direction. The Samayika must commence with the recitation of the following. Namaskara Sutra, or Navakara, thrice. Samyaktva Sutra, or Arihanto, thrice. Guru Guna Smarana Sutra, or Panchidaya, once. Guru Vandana Sutra, or Tiku Oto, Tik Huto, thrice. After salutations, the aspirant must seek permission for Alokana and recite the following in Jina Mutra Alokana Sutra, or Irya Vahiyam, once. Kayotsarga Sutra, or Tasa Utari, once. Agara Sutra, or Anatta, once. Either seated in the Padmasana or standing in Jina Mudra, one must now get into the meditative posture for Kayotsarga. In Kayotsarga, meditate in silence on Logasa till Kandesu Nimalayara. 
conclude by saying aloud, Namo Arihantanam. Now recite the entire Logasa once. Recite Guru Vandana Sutra, or Tikhuto, thrice. Seeking permission for Samayika from God, or from one's Guru. Recite Pratinya, Pratinya Sutra, or Karemi Bhante, thrice. Now, sit with the right knee on the floor, the left knee positioned at a right angle to the floor, the superhero landing pose, basically, with the, uh, and fold your palms like a lotus bud. That one. Recite Pranipata Sutra, Namo Tunam, twice. First time as an obeisance to the Siddhas, and then to the Arhantas. During the second time, say Tanam Sampa Viu Kamanam instead of Tanam Sampatanam, unless you listen to this guy, who's the one telling you to do that. Never mind. Um, yes. Now spend the duration of Samayika. 48 minutes, by immersing yourself in reading, meditation, chanting, religious studies, etc. And if you're a householder, it's okay to let people sin around you. Don't bark at them or make them leave the home. It's your a householder. So, Householder is a term which basically means uh, you're not a fully fledged like either yogi, if you're a, a householder yogi, that means you're a person who practices yoga, you're on the yoga path, but you're a regular guy with a family and a job, regular person, female, male, you know, non-gender, whatever, uh, a person in the world living a normal life. So yeah, you haven't like taken the vow and isolated yourself in a monastery. That means householder, even if you rent an apartment, basically is what I'm saying, even if you're you know, on the street, you're a household. <laughs> I mean, it's a weird thing to say, but that's the, the, of the two designations of types of person on the path. I mean, I think it implies that you're supposed to, have, you know, kind of have, have things together enough, but in the, in the modern world where people can be educated in a lot and yet still struggle enough to be homeless, we, you know, I think we have to adapt our terminology a little bit. So, so in terms of wanting to walk a path like this or like Buddhism or like yoga, um, yeah, those are basically the, generally speaking, the two ways to go. To be, to be a person with a job, a relationship perhaps, you know, not taking a vow of chastity, for example, um, and uh, paying rent and dealing with things in the world and yet being on the path. There's like less restrictions for those folk. And then the fully fledged monk. So, yeah, that's one option for, for folks who, um, I mean, I don't want to like say incels, but like if, if someone is unhappy just working to pay rent and the, the, they're trying to decide between like suicide and like doing a mass shooting, maybe try becoming a monk. Just putting it out there. See, see which which of the options for like the celibate lifestyle of, of monkhood fits best for you. There should be atheist monks. Anyway. Okay. Uh, yes. Where were we? Procedure to, to, to conclude Samayika. Recite the following. Namaskara Sutra, Navakara, thrice. Samyaktva Sutra, Arihanto, thrice. Guru Gunas Marana Sutra, Panchidaya, once. Guru Vandana Sutra, Tikuto, thrice. After salutations, the aspirant must seek permission for Alokana and continue the following in Jina Mudra. Alokana Sutra, Irya Vahiyam, once. Kayotsarga Sutra, Tasa Utari, once. Agara Sutra, Anatta, once. Either seated in the Padmasana or standing in Jina Mutra, one must now get into the meditative posture for Kayotsarga. In Kayotsarga, meditate in silence on Logasa till Kandesu Nimalayara. Conclude by saying aloud Namo Arihantanam. 
Now recite the entire Logasa once. Sit down with right knee on the floor, left knee positioned at a right angle to the floor, and fold your palms like a lotus bud. Now recite the following in the order given below. Pranipata Sutra, Namotunam, twice. Samayika Sampti Sutra, Eyasa Navamasa, once. Namaskara Sutra, or Navakara, thrice. Thank you for going on this ride with me. So now we have an idea, a picture of modern Jainism. But I think it gave us an idea of the path that the Buddha was walking away from. And so the next time you see me on here will not be episode 26 of the Jain Sutras. This is the 25th and last episode of the Jain Sutras recitals on the Edward Reeves Buddhist Books podcast. Next will be something along the lines of Tipitaka episode one. That won't be exactly the title. And since it is the, the Pali uh, translations directly from Pali to English, I'll be calling it Tipitaka, even though 99.9% .9 of all mentions of the three baskets of uh, Theravada, it says Tripitaka using the Sanskrit. But I'll be calling it Tipitaka, and some folks will think that that's a spelling error, but it's not. It's okay. All right. That's it. Thank you all for, uh, for joining me for, for the Jain Sutras. And uh, if this was the first of the Jain Sutras that you saw, then uh, check this out. That is, start with episode one, and that will explain to you why we recited the Jain Sutras on the Buddhist Books podcast. And then you can start to uh, learn about all of those sutras that he mentioned at the end that the person doing the that exercise is supposed to recite all these sutras. It recites the sutras, the first one I recite, but then I learned that I should have other people recite it. And then, uh, and it, it goes in depth into the meanings of those sutras. Um, you know, if it's a practice you want to take on for yourself, or if it's something that you're interested in, you're curious about, you're learning about, maybe in school, maybe you're doing a little bit of extra credit research for, uh, for a comparative religion studies or, or something, Indian history, Indian literature, something like that. Okay, I will now close. And this was the longest of these episodes thus far. Um, I haven't quite decided whether to stick to a half an hour for the uh, Tipitaka or to make these an hour long. But one thing's for sure, it's not gonna be tomorrow. Um, It'll be a few days uh, before we begin. All right. Let us close. To the north and to the south, to the east and to the west, to the spirits of light among us and to the spirits below, we send out our reverent love and compassion. May all beings be happy. May all beings be serene. May all beings be in peace. Until next time.